So we've talked about how mathematics can go places and understand concepts where scientists, you know, are trying to observe things, but, you know, physically cannot go, okay? Well, mathematics also enables us to direct where science should go, where it can go somewhere, but it hasn't thought to gone there yet. So, for example, let's have a look at this. Now, you should recognize this. This is the solar system that you know and love, except it's not quite the solar system you know and love, because if you have a look, um, think with me, the planets you named them, there's Mercury, uh, when we've got, uh, that must be Venus, then Earth, then Mars, okay, Jupiter, the big guy, Saturn, then Uranus, the sideways unusual guy, not worrying about the fact that we don't classify Pluto as a planet anymore, there is one object missing from here, namely, namely Neptune, okay, now here's the thing, um, for a very, very long time, these were all of the planets that we were aware of. Um, these were the planets that we first saw with our naked eye. For instance, um, Venus, because it is um, close to the sun and it's, it's very brilliant in its color because of all its clouds, it reflects the sunlight very effectively. We could see Venus for a long time. In fact, Venus is sometimes called the morning star because it's so bright. Uh, Jupiter, just by virtue of being enormous, okay, also can be seen with the naked eye if you know where to look. Uh, the rest of the guys can be... Um, were seen and identified by telescopes, but Neptune, let's put him in the picture now, Neptune um, was not spotted for a long time, and the reason why is, is, is there's a few reasons. Uh, number one, you guys know that um, the scale of this diagram is somewhat inaccurate. For example, if this is the sun and we were there, we'd all be dead, okay? We are much, much further away from the sun um, than this diagram shows, and everything is much further away from each other, the reason why is because if you put all the planets in a diagram which was actually to scale, there would be tiny, tiny specks and you wouldn't see anything, okay? So this is not uh, accurate with regard to scale, just to make it more interesting, okay? But being that, it's not accurate according to scale. Um, Neptune, Neptune is so, so far away, right? Because it's very, very far away, that means it absorbs and reflects less light from the sun. Right? Like there's less light actually getting out to where Neptune is, which means less of it can bounce back to us so that we can see the thing. Okay? It doesn't mean it's invisible, it just means it's very, very hard to spot. Okay? Um, and so Neptune remained for a long time uh, undiscovered. Okay? Now how is it discovered? How is it discovered? To help you understand how mathematics is involved here and how it really guided the discovery of Neptune, let me ask you this question. Okay? So here's a Here's a, a terrible image because I, I'm a pretty bad artist. Let's try. There you go. That looks kind of Australia-like. All right. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. There we. That, that looks like Earth. Okay. There's Earth. Right. Now, again, not to scale. Suppose I put the moon over here. Okay. There's the moon. A couple of craters. That kind of thing. All right. Now, I'll ask you a, an obvious question. Okay. And humor me. Right. In between the Earth and the moon. Right. Which of these objects? orbits the other one, right? And clearly, it's the moon orbiting the Earth, right? Obviously, like the, the Earth is kind of in the center of the picture, and there goes the moon racing around the edges, okay? The only problem with that is it's not really quite true. I mean, the moon sort of does orbit the Earth. But to illustrate to you how this is actually not entirely accurate, let me just, let me just imagine, okay? Suppose you still had the Earth, Right? But you took the moon and you increased it in size and mass. Actually, the, the size doesn't really matter as it turns out. It's really just the mass that's important. Um, if you took the moon, there you go. There's, there's the moon with all its craters and pop marks, that kind of thing. If you increased it so it was the equal mass as the Earth, well, it looks a bit bigger. But anyway, you get the idea. If it was equal mass, now let me ask this question again. In this system, which object orbits the other one, right? Does the moon still orbit Earth? Or is this time, is the Earth going to orbit the moon? Okay. Now, if you can imagine, right? I want you to imagine now, rather than two planets, I want you to imagine two people. Okay, so let's do it like this. Okay, uh, here we go. Person number one and person number two. Okay, now if you've got two people and they are both holding each other's hands, okay? So if they're both uh, arms outstretched and they are 
holding each other like this, holding hands, okay, and swinging around each other, like throwing each other in a circle, okay. If, just like before, as is in reality, if one object is much lighter than the other one, okay, then this one is going to stay put more or less, and this one is going to move in a circle around. But if they are equal mass, okay, then what will happen is as one spins, the other one will also spin. These guys are not going to one spin around the other, or the other spin around one. They are both going to spin around the point in the center of them, right? In fact, you, this is why I've been talking about mass so much. That point is called the center of mass, the center of mass. That, on, that point there, that point right in the middle of both of them, that's what they both go around, okay? And so now, if you were to think back, so, let's go back to our Earth-Moon situation. If the objects were the same size, then they would orbit each other evenly, okay? Now, even though they are not the same size, even though, as we are aware, the Moon is much, much, much smaller and uh, weighs much less, okay? It has a much smaller mass. This same kind of uh, principle of objects orbiting each other uh, around their center of mass, which, because the Earth is so massive, happens to be inside the Earth, but it's not the Earth itself. Um, this happens all the time, right? These objects are commonly orbiting, right? Um, obviously, the mass of the Earth affects the um, orbit of the Moon, but the mass of the Moon also affects what's happening on Earth. It tugs on Earth just a little bit. Right? I mean, the Earth is much bigger, so it's, it's tugging more, okay? But the Moon is still tugging, and it's tugging in a significant way, which is why the parts of the Earth that um, can be moved more easily, namely the water, experiences tides because of the Moon's mass, right? The Moon is tugging, and, and the, the, you know, Earth and the dust and the um, metals and that kind of thing don't really go anywhere, but the water does because the water is literally fluid, so it gets pulled and stretched and squashed. And that's what we experience as tides, okay? So, now that you understand that even though the moon's not that huge, it has an impact on the movement of the Earth because they're actually co-orbiting one another. Okay? Now you're ready to understand how mass is important here. What was happening is that um, these parts that the, uh, the planets trace around the sun. Number one, they are mathematical parts, okay? They follow certain equations based on the laws of motion that um, Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein and so on expressed about how objects should move in relation to each other when you know how big they are, when you know how fast they're going, etc. Okay? And they all have these roughly elliptical orbits around the sun. But, but, just as I was explaining here, right, not only are all of these orbits shaped by the sun's mass, all of these orbits are also shaped by the orbits of the other planets, okay? Now the easiest example of this is to see Jupiter, right? And Jupiter is huge, obviously. It has the biggest, apart from the Sun, has the biggest um, gravitational pull of any of the objects in the solar system. And for that reason, all of those asteroids and comets that are sort of racing around all over the place, most of them have their orbits significantly affected by Jupiter. Okay. In fact, there's a theory that really, if Jupiter didn't exist, us, we would get hit by way more asteroids and that kind of thing, uh, other celestial objects flying through here, because if it weren't there, its gravitational pull would not be sucking thing towards it, things toward it. Uh, and so in some ways, Jupiter's kind of shielded Earth from a lot of its impacts. But here's where Neptune comes in. Okay? Uh, people were observing all of the orbits, and they knew the laws of gravitation and, how, and the laws of motion and how they should work. And now in particular, look at the orbits out here. Now, if you know how an object is orbiting, then you ought to be able to know, with some um, clever predictions, where to look in the sky each night from whatever location you are on the planet to find such and such a celestial object, whether it's a star or a moon or a planet. Okay? And here's what was, ha what was happening. They were looking at these planets out towards the edge of the solar system. In particular, they were looking at Uranus. Okay? And they were saying, hold on. We know where this planet should be. We know, uh, looking at, at the mathematics of it, we know where it should be ending up, but we look at the telescope, we look at the spot, it's not there. It's not where mathematically we would expect it to be. So something has gone wrong. 
Like our understanding of physics has, um, has got to be fixed up here somewhere, right? Well, they crunch the numbers, they check the equations over and over again. A little bit like when you get a question in exercise and you're, you're getting an answer, you turn to the back of the book and they don't match. What's going on, right? Now they checked over and over again, their calculations were correct, but that planet, right, that second last planet of the solar system still wasn't where they expected. So they had to draw an inescapable mathematical conclusion that there was some object out there that they didn't know about, that they didn't have a record of, that must be affecting this orbit, right? In fact, they not only knew that there had to be something there, but based on what they expected of the orbits of the planets and what they observed and the discrepancy between them, they calculated the exact mass and location predicted of where this you know, mysterious object should be such that it would produce the orbit that they observed. Okay? So you can see here, obviously the science was important. There were observations and repetitions and hypotheses and all that kind of thing. But it was crunching the mathematical models of what was happening and what they expected to happen that told them, here's where the object should be. And, as they actually did, the mathematicians went to a, uh, an observatory. <coughs> Excuse me. They said, look, we're predicting an object. You should be able to find it right here on this particular night. Turn your telescopes there and you'll find it. People thought they were crazy, right? But once they got an actual set of astronomers with an actual telescope to agree, they pointed their telescope there and Neptune was discovered. It was a mathematical discovery, okay? So remember how I said mathematics goes places like black holes that science can't actually go, right? Uh, that is true. And then science comes in and confirms the fact that these things should exist. Mathematics also tells science, okay, well, what sh sort of things should you actually experiment with and repeat and try to observe? Because, you know, if you just think, if you've done an SRP, right? Like, oh, what, what should I experiment with? What should I test? Your imagination can take you so far, right? Who would guess to search at a particular spot uh, except for randomly? Well, the vastness of space would just make it so very difficult to discover things like that. A planet in our very own solar system, mathematics told us, gravitational dynamics told us that's where it should be, okay? Right, one last example for you of mathematics. Um, again, taking, going somewhere where science couldn't go yet and therefore really leading the way for where science should go, okay?